Okay, welcome to the very basics of fission and fusion. And that involves things like what makes uh, the sun and stars shine, how reactors work, how nuclear reactors work, and even how atomic bombs work. There's a lot of variety in this part. Anyway, um, one of the things that we've talked about in earlier videos is the concept of exponential decay, about how something will start, start off really, really rapidly, and then the loss will slow down. Um, this curve might look familiar from earlier videos. What we're talking about today is the opposite, exponential growth, uh, which shows up a lot in nature. Um, something where the growth starts off really slow and then speeds up to really, really high levels. Um, in other words, similar to what is going on with exponential decay in a way, uh, the growth rate is proportional to how much stuff is there whatever it is you're measuring, um, the growth is proportional to however much of it uh, there is that's present. And again, this is a pattern that you see a lot in nature. The uh, diagram I have here is the growth of different types of bacteria, different pathogens. Uh, some of them grow really, really fast. Other ones not as fast, but they all show uh, exponential growth. It's also, you know, probably less remarkably, uh, the same is what you see in patterns of uh, compound interest in a bank account, uh, disease outbreak in a population, or of course what we're going to talk about today, a nuclear chain reaction. So the first thing we will talk about in this area is fission, which basically it's a more formalized word, I guess, for splitting the atom. Most people have heard the term splitting uh, the atom before, and it's a definition here says it's when the nuclei of, of certain isotopes, not all of them, fortunately, uh, certain isotopes split into two or more smaller nuclei, usually just two. Uh, and it's almost always due to neutrons, neutrons hitting the, hitting the nucleus. All right. And what we're going to see in a little bit more detail is about how you can have what's referred to as enriched uranium-235. Uh, these nuclei break apart and then they'll throw out neutrons, usually two to three neutrons, which will hit other nuclei, and they'll break apart and throw out two to three neutrons and on and on. And this is how you see that pattern that starts out sort of slow and then really, really increases. Um, and the isotope that is used in nuclear reactors and in atomic bombs is uranium-235, and that's a pretty important thing to remember usually. All right, to, so to see uh, an animation of this, it usually goes fairly fast. So that's it. <laughs> Although in real life, it's a lot faster than that. In real life, the neutrons are moving at something like 21 and a half million miles an hour, which is about 3% the speed of light. Uh, so, you know, if you blinked and you missed it, you really would have missed it if it had been at actual speed. But since most people probably didn't uh, see the detail of that, I've got another thing queued up here, uh, which we'll do a good bit more slowly. All right, so we got Mr. Neutron comes in and hits the nucleus of the uranium-235 atom. Now one really important part that will sometimes get overlooked at the introductory level is that the neutron doesn't directly just smash into it like it's some carnival game or something. Uh, it will momentarily form uranium-236. And uranium-236 is unbelievably unstable. Very, very unstable. I'm talking more unstable than, say, the keynote speaker at a 9-11 truthers convention. Anyway, it doesn't stay apart, it uh, doesn't stay together very long, busts apart, and then goes and hits other, uh, other nuclei, and then there you have it. That's the main thing that I wanted to focus on in slowing that down was the, just the very, very uh, short formation of uranium-236. Uh, that that leads to the nucleus coming apart and then the kind of the cascade of neutrons. Okay, so as you saw in the animation, it was the neutrons that were really doing everything as far as a nuclear chain reaction. And it's important also to note that only uranium-235 does that. Other forms of uranium will not do that and they won't propagate a chain reaction. And it turns out that uranium-235 is fortunately very, very rare, something like 0.7% of all the uranium on Earth. It's very hard to obtain, and it's even harder to uh, in, 
to enrich, to get concentrated like that. Uh, and it's very fortunate that it is, because if that were not the case, every Curly, Moe, and Larry on the face of the earth would have, uh, at a minimum, you know, atomic bombs. So that's a pretty fortunate thing. Um, so anyway, during this chain reaction, every time a nucleus is split, there's energy released, and then more and more split, more and more is released. And you can either release that really, really rapidly, like a, with an atomic bomb, or you can release it in a more controlled fashion, like with a nuclear power plant. So you basically have got two different ways that this sort of energy can be used, uh, in a peaceful way, like with a nuclear power plant, and a not nearly so peaceful way, like with an atomic bomb. And we'll We'll talk about both, although we'll probably spend a little bit more time on nuclear power plant just simply because it's just inherently inherently more complex. Anyway, so um, either way, and just assume for now we're, we're talking about an atomic bomb. So we set up, you know, an atomic bomb is set off uh, with one kilogram, that's about 2.2 pounds of uranium-235. That releases the same amount of energy as 40 million pounds of dynamite. And in order to help you visualize that a little bit, did a little bit of math here. That's 500 tractor trailer rigs with 80,000 pounds of dynamite each. And then, you know, why did I use tractor trailer rigs? Well, you can line them up. And if you did line them up, all those tractor trailer rigs would be, they would form a line about six and a half miles long, actually a little over six and a half miles long, just to help you visualize that. That's from one bomb. So, and as I, as I said earlier, uh, you can have either control fission or uncontrolled fission. Uncontrolled fission is obviously an atomic bomb. Control fission is what we're going to spend more time talking about in a nuclear power plant. So uh, they they don't release all this energy at once. It's in a more you know uh, controlled uh, method. And one of the ways that they use to control the release of energy is something called nuclear moderation. And that basically just involves slowing the neutrons down. They'll use substances like water uh, and carbon. And if they didn't, the thing is that the, those neutrons are going so fast that they would just pass right through the nucleus. Now, if you have the, sort of the conventional view, view that the neutron hits the nucleus and splits it open, and that's pretty much it, cut and dry. If you didn't know about the formation of uranium-236, you might very well say, you know, so what? But if the neutrons are going too fast, they'll go straight through the nucleus. They'll never, they'll never form that uranium-236, and the fission won't happen. So that's nuclear moderation is a pretty important thing. It's just slowing the neutrons down. Uh, you also want to be able to trap neutrons if you uh, need to, uh, and that completely keeps them from hitting anything, obviously. Uh, and that is something uh, that's done by the use of control rods and they'll be made of various materials. The main thing with the materials is that they need to be able to hit, be hit with a lot of neutrons and not, you know, not react and not degrade. But anyway, that's a uh, thing called neutron absorption, which is different than the moderation. Basically, you just bring down the total of these uh, neutrons, and that slows down the nuclear chain reaction. And this will be the probably the final time that you'll see this nuclear power plant GIF here that I inserted, but this time we're going to walk through real quick and show you what's going on in it. If you see here, this is where all the fission takes place, and you also see where the control rods are. So the, the uranium is in here, the control rods are in here, the water comes in, it heaps the water up to steam, turns the turbine, which turns the generator, which makes power, which turns the lights on there. All right? uh, it's really not with the exception of how the power is actually generated, it's really not all that different from any other type of power plant. Uh, steam heats up and turns the generator and generates electricity. That's really uh, that's really it. Then it's uh, the water is recondensed and they just move it right back through again. But uh, that's really it. It's pretty uh, you know pretty interesting setup and uh, pretty elegant, I think. So, well, as important as fusion is in the universe running the stars and what runs the sun, what powers the sun, uh, we won't be spending quite as much time on it because as of yet, there's no controlled fusion that uh, the humans can do yet, but we have some other stuff that we're going to be talking about. What fusion is, is basically smaller nuclei getting smacked together so hard that they form bigger nuclei, and it releases even more energy 
uh, than fission does. Um, and as I said, it's what runs uh, the sun, what powers the sun, it what, it's what powers other stars. It's basically hydrogen nuclei, and you know, certainly you'll, by this time you'll know what that is. Hydrogen nuclei are smacked together to form uh, just regular old helium-4. Okay, to give you a little bit of a blow-by-blow blow on uh, fusion, I've got a picture here of uh, two isotopes of hydrogen that we're going to see in animation in a second. It's going to go a little bit more uh, slowly so we can see the fusion of these two isotopes, tritium and deuterium, uh, into uh, the product of helium-4. So again, just kind of going step by step here. Uh, tritium and deuterium start out, they get closer and closer, and they get smacked together, and then we have helium-4 and what looks like a bonus neutron for us. But it is important to emphasize in this that this only happens under conditions of very high temperature and very high pressure, such as in the cores of stars, which is one of the reasons why that it has been a good bit more difficult uh, for us to get something that is controlled fusion, which we don't quite have yet. Um, as I believe I mentioned before, fusion reactions do release quite a bit more energy, a lot more energy than fusion reactions. And the only artificial fusion we have thus far basically is nuclear weapons, uh, hydrogen bombs. But there has been research underway for quite some time on developing controlled fusion. And uh, if that is developed, that will be just an extraordinary uh, thing for, uh, for everybody. All right, so to summarize, we'll start where we did at the beginning, uh, that a chain reaction proceeds via exponential growth, and it shows a pattern like that. Uh, that uranium-235 is the isotope that's used, or is the isotope that's used, in nuclear, nuclear reactors and atomic bombs. You can see this diagram here. You may be able to see over on the edge here. It's throwing out three uh, neutrons instead of just two. Usually it's two to three neutrons, and again, uranium-235 is the only isotope of, of uranium that does that, which is why uh, it's a very good thing, that because it's very rare, and it keeps people from getting their hands on it that would be bad news if they got their hands on it. But anyway, it's because of those neutrons, it's the only one that, that propagates that chain reaction, and uh, that's an important thing. Fusion, we also briefly covered that about smashing smaller nuclei together to make bigger ones it generates a lot more energy and when that happens it ends you end up having the product of uh, helium-4 in in the sun and other stars and that is it on the very basics of fission and fusion